known Eric um, since he was probably 13, maybe 14 years old. He joined um, a, reenact, a Revolutionary War reenactment group that I was a member of. And I remember the first time I met him, I looked and I said, is that our new member? Huh, young kid. But it turns out he was not your ordinary teenager that wanted to run around and play with muskets. He had a love of history, more so than most um, reenactors, and especially kids of his age really did. For a short time, we had an opportunity to work together when I was a park ranger at Saratoga Battlefield, um, along with Eric. I moved on to other museums, but now Eric is, um, is still at the battlefield, and rightly so, um, as you'll find out tonight after listening. He is considered to be one of the foremost experts on the Northern Campaign of 1777. He earned his degree in history and fine art from the University at Albany. He's a founder and commander of the recreated 62nd Regiment of Foot, which is a British reenactment group. He and his wife, Jenna, um, who shares all the same loves that Eric does, they live in an 18th century house in the White Creek Historic District in Washington County, just a stone's throw from Bennington Battlefield in the estate of a, lo a royalist officer that served with General Burgoyne. So with that, I would like to invite to the podium, Eric Schnitzer. And before I hand this to Eric, because I will forget, on the table in the back, you will see a musket. Um, one of our museum members, Char um, Charles Weaver, Charlie Weaver, or Charlie um, Wheeler, brought in a, a musket that was carried at the Battle of Saratoga for everybody to look at this evening. So thank you so much for bringing that in. And Eric. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was very, very generous and kind. Uh, well, a very nice introduction. Uh, so thank you to Jamie and to the Historical Society for inviting me here today to talk about my new book, Don Traiani's Campaign to Saratoga, 1777. Uh, I'll explain the title in a moment because you're maybe thinking if you wrote it, why is Don Traiani's book? I don't get it. I'll explain, <laughs> I promise. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to show you the title of the program is called The Value of Revisionism. And for those of you who know me, who have heard me speak before about various subjects related to the Revolutionary War, you, I think, know that I am an unabashed historical revisionist. Please don't let that scare you, because historical revisionism has had some negative connotations in, in, in some ways over the years, because think about it, right? How can you change history? You can't change history. It happened. It's immutable. It can't change. But there's the trap. You see, history isn't just the facts of the past. And indeed, the facts of the past don't change. They happened, you can't change them. You can add to those facts based upon further research, but if you have actual facts, they don't change. But history isn't just facts. History is also interpretation of the facts. Interpretation by who? Historians. Do historians ever make mistakes? Oh yeah, they sure, not me, but I'm kidding. <laughs> of course they do. Historians will make mistakes just like anybody will make mistakes doing whatever they do in life. Um, you've read maybe history books that have errors in them, factual errors or errors in interpretation that you know are incorrect because of whatever reason. You might come with a, a certain expertise yourself. And so if you are to uh, take that faulty information and then change it and correct it, you are a historical revisionist. I'll, I'll demonstrate through some examples of what I mean by the value of revisionism and why it can be, at least I hope in the case of uh, my new book, beneficial and worthy. So I know right out of the door what you're all thinking, really, Eric, another book about the battles of Saratoga. I mean, please raise your hand if you already have, not this book, but any other book about the battles of Saratoga. There's like hundreds of them out there, right? They're coming out every year. Everybody wants to write a book. You know, one of the more recent ones is by Dean Snow, the archaeologist who worked at the battlefield back in the 1970s doing archaeological work. He came out with a book a couple years ago. Richard Ketchum's Saratoga, of course, is very famous, and there are others. So obviously the logical question is, well, Eric, what's so great about your book? Why should we even consider this? I mean, who are you? You know, all of these other historians and archaeologists and enthusiasts have written no end of books on the subject. So what do you have to offer? I'll show you, because I'm glad you asked. 
It all started with this man here, Don Troiani. Uh, as you know, the title of the book is Don Troiani's Campaign to Saratoga 1777. Now, Don Troiani is way more famous and talented than I am. Uh, you might have heard the name before. He is an amazing artist. He is an artist who revels in making accurate historical paintings, battle scenes from the Civil War, or single figure studies. Uh, you see on the table in the back, Charlie brought a, a picture of a British drummer, uh, as he would have been in the uh, Northern Campaign of 1777. By the way, that picture's in the book, too. Uh, but that's the quality of artwork that Don Triani does, and I'll show you a couple more during the course of the program. But he's a world-famous artist, and he decided that a couple years ago that he wanted to do a series of books on various Revolutionary War military campaigns. And the first one he wanted to do was Saratoga. So you see, he's not doing it in chronological order. The second one he's gonna do is actually Lexington conquered Bunker Hill, 1775. But the first one out of the gate was Saratoga. He called me, we're friends. He called me and he said, hey, Eric, this is my idea. I want you to write it. And I thought about it for, you know, two seconds and said, yes, please. <laughs> Uh, it, full disclosure, I, I do like to say this during each of my talks, just in case somebody's thinking, wait a minute, aren't you a federal employee, and isn't this your job, or can you do that? Because so I've been questioned, and the answer is yes. I actually did have to go through a, 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 a formal U.S. government ethics review just to make sure everything was on the up and up. And the things that they were concerned with were, you know, hey, Eric, in your book, are you going to talk about the National Park Service or land management at Saratoga Battlefield or anything like that? No, 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 not at all. Of course not. This is going to be just pure history from the 18th century. Nothing modern about it. And they were like, okay, that's fine. That's cool. You go ahead and write it. So what Don wanted in this book was, there we go, of, oh, of course his paintings were going to populate the book literally from uh, back to front, co cover to back. Artifacts. The book, if you've seen it, is chock full of artifacts and Don's paintings too. Between the two there are over 300 full color illustrations. The best we've ever had so far for another book on the Saratoga campaign are about a dozen black and white illustrations, you know, so... Uh, they pale in comparison, at least in this uh, way. So paintings that Don has done, uh, some of which you might have seen before on brochures, like from Fort Stanwix, and a lot of new ones, mostly new in fact. Artifacts, again, artifacts, real objects from the Northern Campaign of 1777, many of which are um, shocking and many of which have never been seen before. In fact, during the course of my research, there were a couple of surprising things that came to light, and I'm thinking, whoa, holy cow, I found it. It's things I've been looking for for years, and I've actually found it during the course of the research, and there it was. I made sure to put it in the book, so it's uh, very exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Tech, you know. Accurate text. Don was very keen on accurate text. Uh, how do I put this? Don came to me uh, because he knew that I would be the person to do best by the subject, write the most accurate narrative about the historical events. Uh, he did not want hyperbole. He did not want 19th century anecdote-laced you know, stories in the book about you know, Benedict Arnold having conversations in battle and things like that. None of that stuff. Accurate text was very important using primary sources. Whoops, I'm messing this up here. Lots of details and quotes from those primary sources. So Don, in his other book projects with other authors, he, liked to, he likes to have a lot of quotes from the primary sources. As I point out in the introduction of the book, sometimes it's a lot more interesting and cool to read the quoted material from the person who wrote it back then than it is a historian's reinterpretation of the thing that was written at the time. So this book has lots and lots and lots of quotes fully cited, I'd like to add. So if you see something in there, if you're a, a student of the campaign and you're reading it and you see something in there saying, I've never read that before, I've never seen that, where does that come from, Eric? You can go back in the back of the book in the end notes and, and find it. Uh, the source for it, so uh, everything is fully cited. Manuscript sources used. I'm often asked, Eric, what, what sources do you use to, to formulate your research? What exactly do you go to? And most of these things are you know, the, the same things any historian would tell you, journals or diaries. These are the contemporary handwritten 
uh, daily accounts left by officers or soldiers about their daily lives. Sometimes it might be mundane. It might say, rained today. Other times it might say, hey, we fought this battle. And then they'll go on to describe the battle that they fought in. So journals are one of the best primary sources you could hope for. The other are letters. The same thing in the, insofar as that they're contemporarily written, but they're, of course, correspondence between individuals. And often you'll have people, let's say an American militia soldier, write to his parents or to his wife or to his sister about what they're experiencing in camp and in battle, etc. And those are absolute gold for um, uh, uh, providing information. Memoirs. Memoirs are kind of like journals, but they're from memory. Memoir, right? From memory. So they're things that were written long after the fact. So you might have a veteran who served in the Battle of uh, Fort Anne, I don't know, and he wrote in the year 1820 what the Battle of Fort Anne was like. Now, we wished he had written it in 1777 when his memory was fresher and, you know, a little more uh, uh, clear at the time with regard to the experience. Uh, he he uh, had in the battle, but hey, second best would be a memoir. At least he wrote something. Unfortunately, the great majority of people who participated in these events, these battles, they didn't write a thing. So anything, you know, journals and letters are best, but a memoir will take it. Uh, perhaps the most famous memoir from the Northern Campaign of 1777 is that of the Baroness. You might have read it, uh, Madame Riedesel's uh, uh, book. It's actually, it's often called a journal. It's really a memoir. It was published in the year 1800 in Berlin. It is not a journal. It's something she wrote years after the war. Pension depositions, in effect, their memoirs. Uh, thankfully, the United States government over time decided to pass laws allowing for more and more and more veterans of the Revolutionary War to get pensions. But in order to get the pension, you had to provide a deposition about your service. So uh, in the year 1832, 1833, which is when most of the people were uh, uh, allowed to apply, you would have people having to testify to the unit they served in, when they served, where they served, who did they serve under, what battles they fought in, and any interesting anecdotes that they can recall. Now, some of these are amazing, and as long as they're properly curated, that's the word we use today, right, curated, uh, reviewed, uh, then, um, you know, and, and, and uh, corroborated, then that's, that's great. Sometimes, though, pension depositions, like memoirs, you know, they'll write things that aren't quite kosher. You know, I can show you, for example, a pension deposition of an American soldier who was in the battles of Saratoga, but he said that he served there in the battles under the Marquis de Lafayette. No, he didn't. I'm sorry. The Marquis was not at the battles of Saratoga at all. He was with Washington down in Pennsylvania at the time. So, yeah, he's wrong. And if he, writ his, he wrote his service a history in 1777, he wouldn't have said the Marquis de Lafayette, of course not. But later in life, unfortunately, you have sometimes people write things that, you know, just uh, aren't true. But generally speaking, these pension depositions are good, and they're really good, and traditionally not used by historians. Traditionally, historians have simply ignored pension depositions because they think, well, you know what, it's uh, people, you know, decades and decades and decades after the fact, and uh, what they're saying, yeah, it doesn't matter. They, they're, they're getting it all wrong. Oh, and that's not true. Sometimes, yes, but usually they get it perfectly fine, and they provide wonderful stories. Orderly books and ship's logs. Orderly books are sources that are formalized military documents kind of like a journal of a military unit, right? A journal is a private thing that you write in your diary. Well, the orderly book is kind of like a journal for your military unit, and it will instruct the soldiers to do this, that, and the other thing on a daily basis. Orderly books, surprisingly, are not commonly used by historians in their research, unless they're published. If they're published, then it's easy to access and they get them, like Burgoyne's orderly book. That was published back in the 1800s. So every historian who's written about the Northern Campaign of 1777 uses Burgoyne's orderly book, but not you know any of the others that are out there. And sometimes orderly books have major, major, major important information, without which we would not know a lot of things. I don't want to give it all away, but uh, there are times in the book where I reveal certain facts that uh, you'll never find anywhere, but they're in the orderly books or the ship's logs. Uh, ship's logs are orderly books for ships. 
And uh, you might be thinking, what ships were in the battles of Saratoga? Well, the Northern Campaign of 1777, of which this book is about, incorporates all these military events, starting with the Battle of Alcor Island, you know, October 1776, admittedly, but then extending through uh, everything happening with Burgoyne's invasion from the north, Sin Ledger's invasion from western New York, and then Sir Henry Clinton coming up from New York City, and he had lots of ships coming up from New York City. The ship's logs exist, and they're very important by uh, the details that they provide and they uh, tell us about. General reviews. General reviews are incredible because they will tell you very important information about the individual regiments, the units that are fighting in the various battles. General reviews, uh, you could call them inspection returns, if you will. These, uh, both British and American, provide incredible information. I quote from them heavily. And doing so, I bust some major myths about uh, the two armies uh, related to, let's say, the quality of the fighters. No doubt, for example, you've heard that General Burgoyne's army was the most powerful British army ever assembled, and the soldiers were veterans of European battles and everything, which made our victory in the battles of Saratoga so much the greater. The truth is not at all the case. The general reviews prove to us, for example, in this case, that the British regiments were composed of men that were not so great and not at all experienced. I, I point this out in the book quite a bit, and I kind of belabor the point when it comes to the quality of their uh, capacity to fight in battle, because if you don't have great troops fighting your battle, maybe that will have an impact on your success. Just saying. Of course it does. And uh, to, to reveal that is a very exciting fact that I'm able to bring into this book, which I'm, I'm happy to do for you. Courts Martial. Courts martial trials. You know, you have uh, officers or soldiers that get a court martial, uh, and and they're put on trial. Uh, the minutes, uh, the recorded minutes of these trials are amazing and fantastic and really important. Especially the trial of um, uh, Arthur Sinclair. Uh, Arthur Sinclair was the American commander at Forts Ticonderoga and Mount Independence in the summer of 1777 when the British are coming up Lake Champlain. Please remember Lake Champlain flows north, which means that the British coming from Canada south into New York are actually going up the lake. It's a weird concept, but uh, they are. And so Arthur Sinclair evacuates the forts, right? He evacuates the forts, and he was pretty much called a traitor by people of the United States. He just evacuated without even trying to put up a stand against this British invasion. How dare he? We got to court-martial him. So the trial occurred in 1778. And part of the trial, you have people give depositions about what happened, and uh, they submit uh, you know, primary sources, evidence to the trial. And those letters that they uh, submit and those depositions that they provide are incredible. And they give you a much greater understanding of what really happened at Ticonderoga and Mount Independence in the summer of 1777 than you would otherwise get from any of the aforementioned sources. Muster rolls. Very important muster rolls. Muster rolls will help you to identify personnel accurately. I'm a details guy, I will not lie. And whenever I read books about the Revolutionary War, which often happens, it drives me mad when I read misidentified individuals, right? They'll say something like, I, I, this is actually not a made-up thing, but for example, they'll say, you know, uh, Roger Lamb, a British soldier, a sergeant in the 21st Regiment Royal North British Fusiliers. There is a book on Saratoga that calls him that. And I say, what? No, not, he never served in that regiment. He was a corporal in the 9th Regiment of Foot in this campaign. So his rank is wrong and his unit is wrong. Now, does that like change history? No, but I like to have accurate you know, text in, my, in the books I read. So I am very keen to make sure that all of the identifications are accurate and the muster rolls help with that significantly. Maps, historic maps. Who doesn't like maps? They're awesome. In the book, it's populated with historical maps. Admittedly, no modern maps. So uh, there are no modern takes on troop positions in the various battles throughout the course of the campaign. But instead, historical maps were used. Uh, some of them have never been published before, and one of them I'll talk about toward the end of the program is very exciting. I'm very excited to reveal it in the book for the first time ever. So artistic accuracy. Don Troiani is world-renowned for his artistic accuracy. He is, is, is bent on it, as I am with writing accurate text. He is with representing things accurate in the artistry. So for example, 
Jane McRae. We know the, the story, or at least the idea, of Jane McRae and how she was killed by General Burgoyne's Indians. Well, if you do a Google search for Jane McRae, you're going to find a bazillion different kinds of pictures, paintings, drawings uh, done since uh, circa 1801 on Jane McRae and her tragic death. This is one of the more outrageous ones. This was done sometime in the 19th century in which this is supposed to be Fort Edward and the Indians are, are on their horses or galloping toward the British camp and see the American militia. They're trying to kill all the Indians and the Indians very smartly duck. None of the horses are shot, but all the Indians duck except Jane McRae. She didn't duck. Now, to say that this is complete pure fantasy is, well, without saying, uh, the fact is her death and the situation thereof looked nothing like this. But if I may, forgive me, this is the typical kind of piece of artwork that you're going to find in a legitimate history book because it's copyright free, you know? <laughs> so you just put it in there. Uh, if you didn't know, authors of books have to pay for copyright permissions. And it's expensive, but thankfully Don, you know, he's uh, the artist of the book, so he wanted to do the death of Jane McRae. So we researched it in depth, uh, and uh, in depth, believe me, because there's a lot of misinformation out there and you want to make sure you get the details right. And we will never know all the details, right? We won't know exactly how the Indians were painted. We won't know exactly what they were wearing, but we have good ideas about the general appearance of what an Ottawa warrior on a military expedition in the 1770s would have looked like. And because she was killed by an Ottawa warrior, then of course we're gonna make sure to get the correct nation represented. Uh, as for the scene, you know, the general uh, nature of the scene, the view, horses, militia lined up firing volleys, it's all nonsense. So Don wants to make sure to get it accurate. And uh, if you wanna see what the most accurate depiction of Jane McRae's death looked like, look no further. Here it is. So uh, we know that there were two Indians. We know that Jane McRae, forgive me, she was hatcheted and scalped and shot. We don't know the order, unfortunately, but all three things happened to her. It appears that she was trying to struggle away and might have actually gotten at a bit of a run, and they certainly catch her. We know through research that Jane McRae was wearing a black petticoat and a, quote, light chintz gown. So Don makes sure to paint her in a black petticoat with a light chintz gown. Uh, as for her hair color, which is always a big debate, you know, is it black, is it blonde, red, brown, because any source will tell you a different story, uh, the most original uh, corroborative source does seem to trend that it was kind of a reddish brown color. Uh, tending red, but certainly like brownish red somewhere in there. Not flaming red, not black, not blonde. Um, obviously, there is some supposition here, but this is a way more accurate depiction of what Jane McRae's death would have looked like, and the Indians are correctly painted as an Ottawa, or Ottawa, two Ottawa uh, warriors would appear uh, in 1777 with Burgoyne's army. So artistic accuracy is very important for Don, and it extends also to his single-figure studies. Now, Don, what he does is he won't go to a reenactment and just photograph some reenactors and paint them. No, some artists do that. That's not what Don does because that's not gonna get you a good result. Instead, what he does is he hires models that are of like the correct body type, ethnicity, race, etc., cetera, uh, to uh, wear the clothing that he gets. In fact, in this very room, we have a couple of models that appear in the book. Anne and Addie in the back, uh, they're actually, there they are. <laughs> they, there, hi Addie. Uh, <laughs> they're in the book. Uh, they are German followers, uh, women that would have traveled with General Burgoyne's army, uh, uh, you know, a woman and a child, and they're in the book, like I said, but Don will hire uh, actual models or people that fit the right type, and they'll come to his house. He will have them dress in his clothing or otherwise very accurate clothing made by the best experts. If you've ever been to uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon recently and you might have seen some of the mannequins dressed up like Washington with his inaugural suit and other things or Washington uh, on a survey mission or if you've ever been to the new museum in Philadelphia, all of those figures on display, all those soldiers and everybody, the, the person who made all those clothes is a guy named Henry Cook. Henry Cook makes Don's clothes, the reproductions anyway, not the clothes he wears on a daily basis, obviously. Um, as for leather accoutrements like this, that's an original over there in the Charleston Museum, an original pouch 
that would have been worn by a soldier like the one you see in the in the middle there a soldier in the royal regiment of artillery yeah he's a british guy in a blue coat don't let that fool you though uh, so where does Don get that? Well, he has perfect reproductions made of these things. He does not go to the big box store and buy one, because if you do that, yikes, it's a bad reproduction. I even wouldn't want to call it a reproduction, because it's really very dissimilar from the original artifact. But real true experts have looked at these things, made measurements, taken photos in every which way you can imagine, and then they reproduce them. Yes, it is a lot more expensive, but Don will spare no expense to get it right. Muskets, weapons. This soldier uh, has a musket on his person. Where does Don get it? Well, the originals, because he owns them. He owns an arsenal of original 18th century weaponry. I've held some myself when I was modeling for him for some paintings uh, back in the day. So uh, Don's uh, figures will be portrayed with reproduction clothes and accoutrements, but the weapons are original. And this is important because it gives you the absolute accurate proportion if you get a reproduction musket, it is almost a guarantee that the proportions won't be right. But if you have an original, like the one on the table in the back of the room, which was absolutely with Burgoyne's army in 1777, uh, the soldier that the British soldier that would have carried that musket, you know, Don would use original muskets to uh, model uh, his figures on. So as you see, Don is not just some you know artist uh, who's uh, you know cutting corners or the like. Not at all. He wants to make sure things are absolutely authentic as can be. So Don likes accurate paintings, accurate identifications. We both like that. For example, I'd like to show you this. This is an original hat. As far as I know, it's never been in any, actually, I know for a fact it's never been published in any book on the campaign. This hat is an original. It's in a museum, and it was worn by a militia captain who would have served in the siege of Saratoga at what is now Schuylerville, right? The British get there following the battles of Saratoga. They're hemmed in uh, what is now, in effect, the village of Schuylerville. The Americans surround them, and you have a siege occur. Well, this hat was worn on the head by a militia captain. Now, in the book, right, the photograph is in there, and then I wrote the caption for it. Now, normally, what would we call, in the year 2019, what would we call this hat? You can just say it out loud. Yes, a tricorn hat, sure. That we, we universally know that this is a tricorn hat. Would it surprise you if I told you that that term is not an 18th century term? No, it's a mid-19th century contrivance. That term, tricorn hat, was made up in the mid-19th century. So if you go back in time and you go up to a guy in the year 1777 with a hat like that and say, hey, I love your tricorn hat, he'd say... Oh, I get it, try three hat, ha ha, very funny. But he'd tell you he'd never heard of that before because nobody uses the term. So do I use the term in the book? No, I don't, because that's not a period term. I actually point out that it is not a period term because I want this to be kind of, a, if you will, a teachable moment and show people that some of the words and things we use are not necessarily true. So here's another example of, uh, you could say, uh, correct identification. Ever been to Fort Stanwix? In Rome? Oh, some people have, okay, <laughs> cool. It's a really neat historic site, really a beautiful place, very important too. Um, on their brochure, they have a picture of this guy right here, and they tell you that he is Colonel Barry Sinledger. He's the guy who commanded uh, the British expedition against Fort Stanwix, and he was the guy in charge of the British operation against the fort. Colonel Barry Sinledger, and this print is from the 1790s, and look, Colonel Sinledger, it's him, right? I mean, how many Colonel Sinledgers can there be in the British Army? <laughs> yeah, there's a few. And uh, research has proven that this is, in fact, a totally different guy, a guy by the name of John Hayes Sinledger. I pointed out in the book. I'm very proud of this because this actually appears in the book, and I call it an anti-artifact because I have it in the book to just demonstrate that this guy, who you will see in every other book on the Burgoyne campaign, quote unquote, the Northern Campaign of 1777, is not the guy that we've all been told he is. They're actually, you know, uncle and nephew. They're related, um, Barry being the uncle. But this guy is Colonel John Hay St. Ledger. He was never in this campaign at all. It's not even him. So when you see this picture ever on a in a book talking about, you know, Burgoyne and the battles, or I'm sorry, about the, the, the siege of uh, Fort Stanwix, you, you now know this is not, in fact, the guy that they're referring to. 
portraiture. Now, there's a lot of uh, paintings in the book, obviously Don's paintings, but there are some historical artworks in the book as well. Uh, artworks from the 18th century, like Lady Ackland in the boat in the Hudson River, the original painting, uh, which I finally tracked down, got it? <laughs> it's in the book. Um, here's another one. Uh, this portrait is just absolutely sublime. It is owned by a lady, and I do mean Lady Capital L in England. Uh, she owns it, you know, in the manor home. And I had word that she owned it, and I, I contacted her, I reached out to her, and she was really generous to write me back, and uh, thankfully, and she confirmed that she did own this portrait of Stephen Harvey. Stephen Harvey was a lieutenant in the 62nd Regiment of Foot. He fought in the battles of Saratoga, I, well, I'm sorry, Battle of Saratoga, because he died in the first battle, the Battle of Freeman's Farm, on the 19th of September. He died. This portrait was painted just before he came over to Canada in 1776. Then it was in 1778 submitted for exhibition at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. And it was by Sir George Chalmers, who was an artist. Uh, and the title of the portrait was Portrait of an Officer in the 62nd Regiment of Foot Lately Killed in America. That's the title it had in 1778. And I knew it was Stephen Harvey, and lo and behold, Lady Hamilton, no, no relation to Alexander, uh, Lady Hamilton uh, owns it to this day, and she was gracious enough to allow me to publish it in the book. So to have the actual face of a guy who was killed in the battles of Saratoga. I know of only two portraits of people who were actually killed in the battles that have from life portraits and this is one of them. So very, very exciting to have this uh, in the book for the first time ever. But you know, artifacts are cool. You know, we, we love seeing artifacts. Um, for example, this here is a cap that would have been worn on the head of a German soldier, and this was captured in the Battle of Bennington. It still exists, it's in the Massachusetts State Archives. It's in the book, so you can actually see it. You don't have to just see it in a painting or in a drawing, you can actually see in the book a photograph of this original piece. This here is a canteen that was carried by a Connecticut militia soldier in the battles of Saratoga. That button th with the IX on it, the originals like yay big, uh, that button was on the uniform of a British soldier in the Battle of Hubberton. Above it is a war club that would have been in the hands of a Seneca warrior uh, during the Battle of Oriskany, and it was captured by the Americans following St. Ledger's evacuation back into Canada. The Americans took this war club, and it is now, to this very day, at the uh, Military History Museum here in Saratoga Springs. There's a jewel, it says Liberty on it. There's a jewel that's actually a tiny little bit thing, you know, it's a tiny little thing, and it would have been seated in a sleeve link or cuff link, if you will. That was uncovered in the ruins of Fort Montgomery down in the Hudson Highlands, which is part of this campaign. The American soldier wearing this would have been part of the defense of Fort Montgomery, which unfortunately for us was a terrible disaster. It was a great British victory. That over there, that watch, we'd call it a pocket watch today, but all watches were pocket watches in the 18th century, so it's just a watch, you know. Uh, that was worn by a British officer in Burgoyne's army. After the surrender, because of the lack of money and the need for more money that the British uh, and Germans had after the surrender, right, they started selling stuff to the Americans. And one American colonel purchased it. And to this day, it's on display at the Wayside Inn in Massachusetts. And according to the original note from 1777 written by the colonel, he talks about you know the, the experience of buying the watch and how much he uh, purchased it for. And he says that, uh, the British officer sold it to him under price, under price, so he got a good deal out of it. Uh, and last but not least, that thing, it's a flat piece of wood, it's chip carved, it's got a very ornate design, that's called a busk, a busk. And that thing would be worn in women's stays. You know women's stays, they're kind of like a corset in a way? Women's stays sometimes had a pocket down the front where if you had one of these busks, you just slip it in, and it's decorative, although it's really not on display, you can't see it because it's in this, this uh, pocket, if you will. Uh, but that chip carved bust has a provenance of having come from New England in the 1760s. It's dated on the back, in fact. 
And that is exactly the kind of busk that a woman follower with the Continental Army would have worn in 1777, because indeed I do remember the ladies, as Abigail Adams said in this book. We remember the ladies. Artifacts are cool, but artifacts also matter too. You know, they really matter sometimes. For example, would you believe these two innocuous looking things are the reason, the principal reason, why General Burgoyne's army was, uh, remained in America as prisoners of war. Originally, once the British surrendered at Saratoga, they were supposed to go back home to Europe. That was the deal. Horatio Gates, the American commander, signed his name on the, on the paper, and, and Burgoyne signed it, and they thought it was a fait accompli. So there goes Burgoyne's army to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They were expecting to be picked up by the Royal Navy, but it never happened. You know why? Because Congress, when they got a copy of the convention uh, signed by both Burgoyne and Gates, they said, wait a minute, this isn't cool. No, no, we don't want the British to go back to Europe. That's crazy. We want them to be prisoners of war. So what can we do to try to make sure that happens? What they decided to do is they had a few tactics, but this was the one they really set upon and were successful with. They got reports that General Burgoyne's troops were marching out of Saratoga as prisoners, right, on their way to Cambridge, Massachusetts, with those things on their person. And so Horatio Gates noticed this. I talk about it in the book. Horatio Gates noticed this, and he said, uh, why are the British troops marching out with what are called cartridge pouches? And he was told by a British officer standing next to him, the guy said, uh-oh, huh? what did I do? Oh, okay. Oh, um, hmm. There we go. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, Horatio Gates was told by a British officer, he said, no, 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 these things, they're not supposed to be surrendered at, the, at, at Saratoga because the convention of Saratoga said that the British troops were to surrender their arms, which are owned by government, like a musket, for example, on the back table. But these are accoutrements. These are owned by the colonels of regiments and therefore private property, not subject to be surrendered. And Gates' response was, oh, yeah, makes sense to me. So Congress, they hear about this and they're enraged. They say, oh, no, 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 not fair. These things have to be surrendered too. And uh, it's a long story. Uh, it's in the book <laughs> because it's important. But Congress eventually passed a resolution saying that because the British marched out of Saratoga, i.e. Schuylerville today, right, wearing their accoutrements, which should have been surrendered, they claim. I prove that's not the case. The British were correct. But they were supposed to be surrendered, say uh, Congress. Therefore, Burgoyne's army will remain prisoners of war for the rest of the war until the court of Great Britain signs off on the convention. Burgoyne's not enough. We have to have the court of Great Britain do it. And is the court of Great Britain going to do that? No, because that would, in effect, legitimize the United States' ability to force a British army to surrender. It'll never happen. And the Congress knew it. It was, you know, they, they knew what they were doing. And therefore, you find that uh, Burgoyne's army remains as prisoners in America. Now, why does that matter? Because not only is the British army and the Germans with them kicked out of the war for, for years and years and years as prisoners in New England and in Virginia and in Pennsylvania, but I can't tell you how many, at least tens of thousands of people in the United States today are descended from these guys who deserted. A lot of people come to Saratoga Battlefield telling me about their British soldier, German soldier ancestor. Had that not happened, they wouldn't be alive today. It's kind of weird, but true. Nomenclature matters. Anybody know what a Tory is, quote unquote? What's a Tory? Yeah, yeah, loyalist, sure. Uh, this is the common moniker given to people who were loyal to the British crown. So if you, if we're all good patriots, right? Americans uh, fighting for freedom, independence. If somebody said, God save the king, we'd point him out as a Tory, wouldn't we? Tory. The problem with Tory is that it's a pejorative. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a nasty word to call a loyalist. So historians usually refer to the word loyalist instead. Loyalist, right? That is a word that, you know, is not a pejorative at all, which it's not. You know, it's, it's nice to call somebody a loyalist. I'd like to be loyal, you know. Not to the crown, obviously. Rebel. 
Well, if you're a rebel, what side are you on? Of course, you're on the side of the revolution. You're on the side of George Washington and, and Horatio Gates, and you're fighting against those Tories. But rebel is also a pejorative. Please understand that loyalists, right, never called themselves Tories. And what we usually use today is the word patriot. Patriot? Uh-oh. There it is. <laughs> The word patriot is what we usually refer to instead of rebel, because rebel's a pejorative, Tory's a pejorative, so we usually say loyalist and patriot. So far, it makes sense. But I don't like those words. I don't, and I'll tell you why. And I had never thought of this until years ago, right? I'm giving tours at Saratoga Battlefield, and people, I'm giving a talk about, let's say, John Freeman. He was a, a loyalist, right? He sided with the crown. I've had people say to me, um, Eric, you say that John Freeman was a loyalist, but you mean he's not loyal to the United States? Think about it, right? Why are we using the term loyalist to describe the people loyal to the enemy? Why aren't we using the term to describe those loyal to the United States? It's kind of a weird thing. And when I've been asked this a couple times by visitors at the park, I'm like, yeah, that is odd. Why do we do that? The, re the problem with the word is it's subjective. That's the problem, right? That's a pejorative. That's subjective. In other words, it's in the eye of the beholder. You're loyal to anything, right? Anybody can be loyal to their cause. In truth, if you go up to an American who's fighting for independence and you say, are you loyal to the United States? Of course they'd say yes. Then you'd say, well, are you a loyalist then? Well, they'd probably scratch their head thinking, what are you trying to do, play words on me? Uh, but I prefer to use the word, and I didn't make this up because it is a period word, I prefer the word royalist. If you use the word royalist, there is no subjectivity, there is no pejorative implied, you're not making fun of anybody, and when you call somebody a royalist, you know exactly what side they're on. I do find it interesting that whenever military forces are described in the English Civil War, anybody loyal to the crown, they're referred to as royalists. Not loyalists. Hmm, interesting. Why is it that we use the different word here? There is actually reasons for it, but no need to get into that. But royalist is a period term that is absolutely superior to loyalist and certainly to Tory. What about patriot, though? Now, believe me, I'm an ardent patriot, but patriot is subjective. Everybody's a patriot depending on what side they're on. I can show you many letters written by British officers who say, that man, that other British officer over there, he's a patriot. You know, there's a reference to a guy, in fact, who is, quote, a patriot for the crown, right? So obviously he's not fighting on the side of the United States. Again, patriot is subjective. Without further context, you don't know what side you're talking about. Now, of course, in the United States, we get it, patriots, you know, independence, United States, of course. But this is a history book, and I like to be, shall we say, balanced. And so I prefer the term revolutionary. So you're not a patriot American. I mean, you are, I suppose, right? Uh, because you're fighting for the United States, you're a patriot. But I don't think it's a good word to use. It's not a, a, uh, 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 an easily identified word insofar as it's too subjective. Revolutionary American, I think, is the superior term revolutionary American. And please do understand that uh, during the Revolutionary War, George Washington, he would never say, ever, and this never happened, they would never say, move the Patriot Army from point A to point B. They never said that, never. So it's not like I'm reinventing words. Well, I kind of am, but it's not like I'm uh, taking a perfectly valid word from the period and tossing it out, because I'm not. Uh, patriot is a, a modern word that we apply. Revolutionary American, though. Now, that's a word that nobody would be able to dispute in the Revolutionary War. It's not a pejorative, and it's not subjective. Now, foreign words, and I have to be careful because uh, my Uncle Peter's here, and he'll know if I'm saying these words correctly. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to do in this book, as a bit of a maverick on this one, I, I contacted Don, and I'm like, Don, I have an idea. You know, we have a lot of French 
uh, involvement in, in the book, you know, with French Canadians mostly. We have uh, German soldiers like this man here. What if I was to use German words to identify certain uh, points of material culture? I would have the translations directly after that in parentheses, so you don't have to know the German language to know what these particular words meant. And the reason why I wanted to do it is because I wanted to press the point that the people that you see in some of these paintings, like this German soldier here, who would have fought with General Burgoyne's army, they're from a totally different country, a totally different place. You know, they're in this revolutionary war and we're talking about them through our English language, but wouldn't it be kind of cool to use some German words in the mix, again, with translations following them uh, right after. So, for example, this guy here. This is from the book. This guy is a private of the Grenadier Company of the Braunschweig Infantry Regiment von Riedesel. And I write that German grenadiers were the elite soldiers of German infantry regiments, easily identified by such distinctive features as Grenadier Mützen, grenadier caps in parentheses, grenade decorated patronentaschen, which are cartridge pouches, and mustaches. In Burgoyne's army, Braunschweig Grenadiers Company, Braunschweig Grenadier Companies, tongue twister, from the regiments Prince Friedrich von Riedesel, von Reitz, and Specht were consolidated into the Grenadier Battalion Bremen. This Gemeiner Grenadier, Grenadier Private, is dressed in marching order with a Tornister, which is a knapsack, a Feldflasche, which is a canteen, and a Brotbutel, which is a haversack, which carried rations. So again, does it like, you know, change history or, or we now know more about the battles of Saratoga? Not necessarily, but it's a neat little thing I thought I'd include in the book, which had never been done before, so I wanted to do that. Busting myths. This is a major focus of, well, I shouldn't say focus, that's not quite true. It's a major theme of the book. As I point out in the introduction, I do not bust every known myth on the Northern Campaign of 1777. There are lots of myths. You could write a hugely thick book just addressing the myths. I don't do, I didn't put this book together just to bust myths. But there are some myths that have to be quashed, and there's a lot of them that have to be quashed, and I tackle many of them, maybe most of them. Uh, here's one for you. Here is Don Traiani's painting, a brand new painting showing General Burgoyne surrounded by some of his general staff. And uh, can anybody tell me what General Burgoyne's nickname was? Yeah, sure. Uh, many people know the, the, know the name, Gentleman Johnny. Would you believe it's made up? Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne is made up. It's made up, totally made up. If you look into the historiography, which is the history of the history, you're going to find different authors say, oh, he was called Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne because he was such a partier. You know, he brought all of these lavish things with him, like one author actually claims that Burgoyne had a string quartet with him. I, I kid you not. I, no need to name names, but yeah, he actually claims that champagne and wines and, you know, all of this nonsense and he's partying and womanizing and all these things, and that's why he was called Gentleman Johnny. Yet another author will say, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne was called that by his men because he was so nice to them because he never ordered them to be flogged when they did something bad. Flogging is whipping, of course, on the bare back. So that's why he had the nickname. The men loved him. He was called Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. It's all made up. It's all made up, completely untrue. General Burgoyne had nicknames, and I, I mentioned one of them in the book. It's kind of funny, in the caption for this particular painting, an actual 1777 nickname, and there were others. But this one, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, the one that we all know, is made up. You know what it was made up? 1927, it formed the title of General Burgoyne's biography. 150 years, you know, published 150 years after Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga. It was called, the book called Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. And I mentioned that in the, in the book, in the caption. And it's totally made up. And since then, everybody knows that that's his nickname, even though it wasn't. Isn't that crazy how history works? And I promise you, this is true. I'm not making this up. I'm not, you know, crazy Eric making up some theories. I swear to you, this is the truth. It's a made up nickname, never existed. Yet we all know it. That's how history works. It can be dangerous. Some major revelations in the book, now wrapping up, uh, and this is just some of the major revelations because there are many more. <laughs> I don't want to give them all away. 
the real strategic result of the 1776 Battle of Valcor Island. You cannot read a book about Benedict Arnold or read a book about the Battle of Valcor Island and have anything but the author tell you that the battle, okay, it was a tactical defeat for the Americans, but holy cow, Benedict Arnold stopped the British invasion of 1776 and he turned the British back into Canada because they were so spent in the Battle of Valcor Island completely untrue, completely false. It never happened, as I prove in the book. And by the way, if you're interested where that story comes from, Kenneth Roberts' Rabble in Arms, 1930s, historical fiction. He popularized the myth of the Battle of Alcor Island having any strategic value for the United States. It had none, and I'm brave enough to point it out. The real reason why Arthur Sinclair evacuated Forts Ticonderoga and Independence. Um, ever hear the story that, you know, the Americans are up there, Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Independence, the two forts on both sides of the lake, and the British are coming out of Canada, right? General Burgoyne, they're, they're surrounding the peninsulas, and then the British realize, oh, look at that height, look at that hill, Mount Defiance, or Sugarloaf Hill, if you will, it went by two names. If we put cannons on top of that hill, that mountain, we can uh, command the valley below, and we'll be able to blast the Americans out of the forts. Heck, just the threat of the cannons on the height will scare the Americans away. And so the British, right, they bring their cannons up. There's even a painting that was commissioned by the state of Vermont showing this with British artillerymen, you know, on the top of Mount Defiance. And down below, you see the American garrison, and they're, they're kind of like, oh, no, the British have gotten on top of the mountain. What will we do? And the Americans evacuate because of that. It's a lie. Never happened. Never happened. In fact, General, I'm giving a little bit away, General Fraser, a British general, literally states in a letter written right after the Battle of Hubberton, which happened right after the American evacuation of the forts, saying that, yeah, uh, he's writing to a friend of his in Scotland, saying, yeah, um, we figured that the artillery would be able to get up on the uh, top of Mount Defiance by the evening of the 6th of October, I'm sorry, October, July, the 6th of July, uh, you'll note that the Americans evacuated over 12 hours earlier. Plus, the court-martial of Arthur Sinclair very clearly talks about why they evacuated, and it had nothing to do with phantom cannons on Mount Defiance. It had to do with other things, uh, but no cannons. There were never cannons there. That convinced the Americans to evacuate. It never happened. Yet, it's a story we all know, right? Where a goat can go, a man can go. Where a man can go, he can drag a gun. Another made-up mythical quote never happened. The circumstances and ramifications of Jane McRae's death. We've all heard this one, right? Jane McRae unfortunately is killed and then the militia enraged by her death are going to come out to the tune of tens of thousands and they're going to stop the British because after all, if the British Indians are going to kill a woman who was a, a, a loyalist, right, a, a, a citing on the crown, then they'll kill everybody who's not for the British. That's the story we hear. As I point out in the book, it's totally the opposite. In fact, Philip Schuyler, commander of the American army at the time, continued to complain through the rest of July, through August, saying, we can't get militia to come to this army. Quote, the people of the army are terrified of the Indians. John Glover, the same guy who, you know, tra uh, uh, crossed the Delaware River with George Washington with the boats, right? Uh, Glover's marblehead fisherman. He wrote a letter a couple weeks after Jane McRae's death saying that 100 Indians in the woods do us more damage than 1,000 redcoats. The Americans are terrified of the Indians. I mean, you saw them earlier, right? Painted uh, in black and white. They're terrifying in the woods in particular, and the Americans knew it. There's a totally different reason why you had a lot of, of outpouring of militia, but that doesn't happen until late September, early October. There's a delay. Jane McRae is killed on the 26th of July. It takes a long time for the militia to come and join the American army, and they do so for a totally different reason, having nothing to do with Benedict, or I'm sorry, with uh, Jane McRae's death. And in fact, they joined uh, you know, after most of the Indians had left Burgoyne's army. So uh, they, they do so then, and not because of her death. The real reason why Burgoyne uh, redirected Balm to Bennington, authors will come up with different reasons because they didn't have the correct source material to figure it out. There is an incredible unpublished journal 
for the German command of Burgoyne's army kept by General Riedesel. And it is recorded, it's a journal, on a daily basis. It is intended for the eyes of the Herzog von Braunschweig, which is the Duke of Brunswick, the, basically the leader of the Duchy of Brunswick. And uh, the journal is a record of General Riedesel's you know, comings and goings, and he point blank explains, and he's the only guy to do it, why Burgoyne redirected bomb to Bennington. And when I found the answer to that, it was shocking. I couldn't believe it. Had to make sure it got in the book. Burgoyne's true intentions on October 7th, there's been a lot of like booklets and papers done on what he really meant to do on the 7th of October, the thing that precipitated the Second Battle of Saratoga. And I demonstrate uh, through proof that we know what he was up to. We don't have to guess. We know for a fact what his plan was. Arnold's and Gates' relationship on September 19th and October 7th. If you've heard my talk on the Nathaniel Bachelor letter and how that was the impetus for a massive research project to try to figure out exactly what Arnold's and Gates' relationship was on the day of the Second Battle of Saratoga, of course, that research is now for the first time ever in this book. Also, uh, I, as I understand it, uh, uh, Nathaniel Philbrick's uh, Valiant Ambition, second edition, he got it in there too, thankfully. I had a talk with him about that. He said, oh, wow, that's great. Second edition then, because unfortunately he had published his first edition before the research was complete. But this book has it in there, so it's very exciting to have that correct information in the book. Ah, uh, here it is. Kosciusko's 1777 miniature portrait drawings and Saratoga siege map. You know, we all know about the right, twin bridges, the Tadeusz Kosciusko Bridge. Uh, that's uh, named after Tadeusz Kosciusko, who was second in command of the American Corps of Engineers at the Battles of Saratoga. What you might not know about him is that he was a painter, like an artist, and he would paint pictures of American officers. I found two of them, the originals, from 1777, and they're in the book. Uh, Enoch Poor and Gamaliel Bradford, they're so cool. They were actually painted at Ticonderoga in the uh, um, very early uh, summer you know, slash late spring of 1777. During the course of my research, I finally found something I knew existed, other historians knew existed, but we couldn't figure out where the original was, his original map of the Siege of Saratoga. Uh, it does post date 1777, but it's his. It's a manuscript drawing on laid paper, signed by him, and it's all written in Polish, which is really cool. Uh, so that has never been seen before, never published before, and I'm excited to bring that to you. The actual words exchanged between Burgoyne and Gates on October 17th. Even the film at Saratoga Battlefield has the wrong quotes that were manipulated in the 19th century for just who knows what. But a guy who was a staff officer who was with General Gates uh, at that moment wrote in his daily journal right after it happened, or you know, a couple hours later probably, he wrote down in quotes exactly what was said between the two of them. And they have never, that quote has never been used because historians didn't know about the Hezekiah Smith journal. He was chaplain to uh, 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 one of the brigades, Continental Army brigades, in the battles of Saratoga, if you were wondering. But to have it in the book is kind of neat. The actual words, not made up words, but real words. And last but not least, and again, this is just some revelations, but the, a never seen before, this is probably one of the most exciting artifacts, a never seen before circa 1781 portrait of an infamous traitor. I bet you know his name. Fought in the battles of Saratoga, a great hero. Couple years later, he betrays the United States, becomes a British general. His portrait of him in his British general's uniform still exists. It's actually owned by the family in England. Well, his portrait painted in New York City circa 1781 uh, of him in his colonel's uniform of the American Legion also exists. Yeah, it's called the American Legion. It's a royalist uh, combatant unit called the American Legion. But uh, he was trying to you know, get Americans to join his unit to fight for the crown. Didn't work out well. But his, uh, the original portrait of the guy in his uniform, it has never been seen before. Very exciting to see that. So again, not a made up picture from some print from 1850 or something like that, but the real thing done in, you know, from life at the time. So is historical revisionism a good thing? I hope you think it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. about the stereotype, you know? So it's like, oh, the British officer corps, idiots, a bunch of, you know, 
bumpkins fighting in the woods, blah, blah, blah. They don't know what they're doing, and so they're easy pickings for the Americans, uh, which might be sometimes the case, but it's not nearly as cut and dry as that. So that's kind of the, uh, a myth bust that I wanted to do in the book, but it's one that I've always had in mind because of years of research. But the one, I think, Jamie, to um, answer your question, the one that surprised me the most was actually General Reed Azel's accounting of his conversation with General Burgoyne in which Burgoyne told him why he, Burgoyne, redirected Baum to Bennington. So basic story is this. The plan was for Colonel Baum to send a detachment of troops into Vermont. It is Vermont, please, not the Hampshire Grants. It is Vermont. I explain why in the book. Uh, <laughs> so he goes into uh, Vermont, or he's supposed to, and then he's supposed to go up into the, uh, like, to uh, Brattleboro, Connecticut River Valley. I mean, it's crazy, right? And then he was going to sweep back west and then meet up with Burgoyne at Albany. And so that was the plan. Reed Azel and Burgoyne, they all planned it. There goes Baum. Reed Azel then goes to Fort um, George, which is kind of near, next door to where Fort William Henry is today, and to inspect things there. Comes back at night, back to uh, Fort um, Edward, and there's Burgoyne. And Burgoyne says, and again, this is in a daily accounting an official record of the German uh, troops. And General Burgoyne tells him, hey, General Redesel, I just redirected Baum today. Sorry you weren't part of that conversation, uh, but, but here's my reasoning for sending Baum to Bennington rather than way up to Brattleboro. And the reason he explained was surprising. It's in the book. I don't know if I should say. It's kind of, I should? Okay. All right. The boss says yes, so I will. <laughs> So what, what Burgoyne said was this. He, Burgoyne, had received intelligence that Philip Schuyler, who was commander of the American Army at the time, stationed at Stillwater, that's where the American Army was at the time, in Stillwater. This is before their further retreat south, uh, down to the Sprouts. Uh, uh, General Burgoyne said that he had intelligence that General Schuyler was preparing to send relief to Fort Stanwix. And because of that, Burgoyne thought that Brattleboro was way too far flung to be, say, a threat to the American command, Philip Schuyler. So Burgoyne thought, if Baum is redirected somewhere closer to the American army at Stillwater, Bennington, where there's a supply depot, because they had to go to a supply depot, that was key. Uh, but if they're going to somewhere closer to where the American army is, i.e., again, Bennington, then they can be meaning Baum's detachment can be a viable threat to the American command. And Burgoyne is hoping that by switching Baum from going to Brattleboro, from going to, Brattleboro to Bennington, that he will, uh, you know, Baum's uh, expedition in that area will convince Schuyler that he cannot weaken his army by sending a detachment down for the relief of Fort Stanwix. Now this is so interesting because the whole point of Sun Ledger's expedition in the Mohawk Valley was to be a, uh, a diversion in Burgoyne's favor. And come to find out what's going on, General Burgoyne is altering his strategies in order to help Barry Sun Ledger, who was caught up in the siege of Fort Stanwix, which is a whole debacle I talk about in the book. It's ridiculous that uh, you know, Barry Sun Ledger comes out of Canada and he thinks he's just going to walk waltz right down the Mohawk Valley. Then he gets to Fort Stanwix, or as the Americans called it, Fort Schuyler. And uh, they're surprised that, holy cow, there are actually troops in this fort. And the fort's well manned, and the fort has lots of cannons and lots of supplies. We can't leave that in our rear, meaning we can't continue down the Mohawk Valley. That's madness. Now we have to besiege a fort. Uh-oh, we don't have cannons to do it that are going to be effective at all. So St. Ledger is kind of playing a cat and mouse game with the Americans at uh, Fort Schuyler slash Stanwix, and it's dragging on. Uh, shortly thereafter, the siege um, begins. You have the Battle of Oriskany, uh, you know, but the British are still there, still surrounding the fort. And so Schuyler's hoping to relieve the fort, which he eventually does. Uh, the whole idea of sending Baum to Bennington, of course, Baum is destroyed in the Battle of Bennington, which was in fact fought in New York, as a, you, you certainly know, in Wilumsac. Uh So the whole strategy didn't turn out well, shall we say, but because of the redirection of Baum, Baum loses in the Battle of, of Bennington, then Bremen comes up, the second phase of the battle, it's a loss there too. Again, I talk about it in the book, but Schuyler's like, I'm sending troops down the Mohawk Valley, no problem. Because Baum is gone, you know, the threat is gone thanks to General Stark 
and the American militia who fought that battle. That was, I think, the most surprising reveal to me, and so far as narrative reveal. In terms of artifact reveal, it's, for me personally, certainly the Stephen Harvey portrait. The Stephen Harvey portrait's just amazing. How old is everybody? Stephen Harvey. He's 16. Stephen Harvey, that kid that you saw, that boy there, 16 years old, yeah. And if you're wondering why him, you know, why was his portrait exhibited at the Royal Academy of Arts since other uh, teenage officers were also killed, it's because his uncle was Lieutenant General Edward Harvey, the adjutant general of the entire worldwide British Army. And so when your uncle is Edward Harvey, obviously you're going to be memorialized properly by getting your portrait uh, by the family putting the portrait, I should say, in the exhibition. Yeah, I mentioned that in the book too. <laughs> Any questions or? Wow. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming today. I, uh, if I may, uh, uh, selfless uh, plug. I, I do have a couple copies of the book uh, here. Um, they are, you know, cover price fifty dollars each. I only have a, a few, unfortunately. I'd be, of course, happy to sign any copies, but. If uh, you want to get it elsewhere or whatever, Barnes & Noble in Wilton has it, uh, Northshire Books has it uh, here. Uh, I'm sure Amazon has it, you know, Amazon has it all, right? So uh, if you're interested, I, I'd be happy to sell you a copy. Um, but um, otherwise, thank you so much for being here, and I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I know it's a late evening. Um, Hope to see you in our November program and at the Holiday Gala. And do not play on the Lions teams. Play on our team. <laughs>